dominant species on this planet. And we have this amazing capability. I mean, it's just phenomenal. We can create whatever environment we want. And we're doing that for the last 250 years with ever more advanced thinking, technology, and tools to where we can change things just like in a week, like dramatically change it. Our nervous system actually has two ways to deal with that change. Now one way is called neuroplasticity, and neuroplasticity is your brain's phenomenal ability to change on the fly. And we kind of heard about that with the, the guy speaking about meditation, because if we meditate, our brain actually changes. Well, as we deal with things like environmental change, and as we deal with injury, our brain has this capability of change at that point as well, and there's all sorts of impact to those changes. Now, adaptation is sort of the other side of that coin. Adaptation is you stand ready to deal with the situation as it is with no requirement for neuroplasticity at all. And the way I see it is we've created a world where we're not adapted for it anymore. And I think the evidence is easiest to see in our children. And so where is this evidence? Now, one place you can see it is in our diets. We have this obesity epidemic happening, and I'm pretty sure it's because we're not adapted to eat the foods that we have available to us and the combinations that they are in and the sort of quantities of sugar and fat and other things that the, the food has, and that's to our detriment, right? We create all sorts of problems from that, and one way we solve the problem is through pharmaceuticals. And there is an explosion of drug taking in our country. And so we have these problems that are created from the pharmaceuticals, but then we also create uh, environments in which our children are stressed out, and one of them is producing toxic stress in the classroom, and I think that really just mirrors the toxic stress that we're seeing in the workplace. And so all of this produces some really crazy behaviors between parents and, and children, like non-connective, aggressive behaviors in, on both sides. And then undercurrent, like under all of this, there's this thing called um, depression and anxiety, and it's growing really quickly. And one of the fa fastest growing segments of depression is preteen depression. Preteen. And so my hypothesis is we've um, dramatically changed our environments, and that we've actually lost touch to what an environment might look like that we would thrive in, that we'd be fully adapted to. Like maybe it was just going on too long, and. and Mothers have this intuition, because I talk to them and they say it, like, I know this isn't working, but we don't necessarily have the experience or the thinking around the environment we could create. And so I, I thought maybe we should look at indigenous cultures that are on the, on the planet today, hunter-gatherers, and see what they do, because they've been doing it for thousands of years, and it's likely what they do is uh, something, excuse me, something we're well adapted to. And so the... There's 14 right now, and the one that um, I looked at was the Bushmen of Botswana. The reason I did is a uh, mentor and friend of mine, John Young, who wrote a book called Coyote's Guide. It's a similar work on connecting your children with nature. He um, spent a lot of time there, and he related a lot of his lessons, and I'm going to share a few of those with you today. So just going through some more Wikipedia facts around the Bushmen. First, they're hunter-gatherers, so you can think of them as the original, sustainable, slow cook. They're not vegan, but they're high, high vegetarian diet. You know, they are living off the same land for literally centuries, so you know they're doing it right. They have no social duties for their children except to play. That's none. Every, um, everyone is involved in rites of passage and in mentoring the children of the community. No one's off the hook. Leisure is really important to them. They spend a lot of time with leisure activities. So you can imagine the mornings are rousted up and they do their hunting, hunting gathering, and the afternoons and the evenings they move into the leisure time. Not a 40 hour work week. <laughs> Women have very high status. They become elders. They're not um, penalized by taking time off to have kids and that kind of thing. <laughs> There's a egalitarian society, it's a decision by um, consensus. The elders don't make rules and then make people follow the rules. The elders facilitate conversations with everyone else to make sure we have consensus and they make decisions based on the benefit of the group, not the individual. And finally, they're a gift-giving economy and those in most need get the most gifts. 
And, you know, I think you can kind of see, like, there's bits and pieces of this in our culture currently. But like, we're not absent of it. But, man, if we could get more of this, doesn't it, just like that intuition is starting to think, man, that would be really good. So one place that I thought it'd be cool to look is how did the Bushmen play? Because they spent a lot of time in leisure. And um, John Young relates this story that I'm going to um, tell you right now. And he went and he integrated himself and his team into their culture for a number of months. He's done this a few years in a row now. And he talks about observing them at play and then actually playing with them. And when he observed them at play, he saw that all the adults played, in this particular picture there, um, doing a jump rope game, like a very aggressive, fast-paced jump rope game. And the adults would all play it, and they'd kind of play themselves out, and they'd put down the jump rope, and in would run, run in all the children. Like the children actually weren't invited to play until the adults were done. <laughs> Think about that. Now, on the sort of the masculine side, because this is more, everyone plays all the games, this is more of a feminine game. On the masculine game, there's like a, a, a spear that they throw, and they have to bounce it off the ground and hit a target. It sounds really challenging. And same thing, all the men and women are out there doing it, and they're cheering each other on, and then they stop, and they go do their next whatever. And the kids run in, and they start playing. And so John wanted to talk to them about this and about teaching children the sort of the skills that they need to be a hunter-gatherer, and he was leading them to, you know, to confirm his suspicions that it was important to teach children survival skills. And what happened was one of the elder women said, John, you got it all wrong. That's a paraphrase. <laughs> what, what's important isn't that we teach them. I mean, that's important, but what's important is that we know them. Because how can we possibly teach them, or how will they learn if we don't know it ourselves? And so I really thought about it. I'm like, well, where the heck are we playing as adults? And I asked a bunch of parents, and I got some really wishy-washy answers, like, well, I go to the playground with my kids if they're younger children, or, you know, I go to their games. I'm like, that's a spectator. And, well, I go to the gym. I'm like, well, okay, is that play, really? Ride my bike? You know? Are we playing, you know? And then, and then I was at a, uh, a restaurant that had a bar, and I was eating, and some guys, I was you know, thinking about this, and some guys in the bar made a rus ruckus. They were like really getting into it, and I realized there was a model. <laughs> but the problem is they're trading entertainment for play. They're actually um, not participating in the play, but they're having fun. And just to not let um, you ladies off the hook, you know, there's plenty for you. And now we're on computers, and we've got our smartphones, and we're, it's literally all the time, right? I mean, you can access anything on your phone anytime, and you can entertain yourself in all sorts of email, Facebook, Twitter, games, whatever ways. And you know what we're going to get, right? And we're getting it in space. Because kids are just going to give it right back to us. But there's something a little bit more insidious, a little bit less intuitive around this, and that's the point of focus. Because as adults, if we trade entertainment for play, the focus ceases to be on us and on us in the center of our child's life, and it becomes on, you know, maybe the sports stars that the guys were watching, like football players, or you know, recent uh, live TV sorts of performers, or you know, I think anchormen are really uh, good to look up to, but they're also taking your focus and. You know, there's all sorts of stuff going on on TV and the mainstream media, and there's you know, pop artists. And I mean, there's even like, sort of on the fringes, things like these group of housewives. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm definitely not saying entertainment is bad. I'm not actually judging these people. I'm just saying that we're making a trade, and I'm thinking the, the trade's ineffective. Like, it's not producing an environment that our children will play in. Now, um, I did this talk a bit ago, and I wrote an article on it, and my copywriter came to me and said, hey, this was early in the summer, hey, we're about to have Olympic fever, can you write an article on kids in competition? And I thought, oh yeah, it's a great segue from play, and I really thought about it, and I thought it's a no-brainer too. I mean, I was a Navy SEAL, I played competitive sports in high school and college, I am an entrepreneur, I'm competing in the marketplace, and I've been honed by competition. So I started writing it like competition is really good, and I had this itching feeling like maybe I had a blind spot. Mm -hmm. well, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at um, Alfie Cohen's work first, and I hit gold with that. And if you don't know Alfie Cohen, I highly recommend you read 
some of his work, especially on grades and classroom dynamics. Um, but he had this to say, competitiveness, the desperate quest to be people. And, you know, I sat with that for a bit and I thought about it. And, you know, I looked in the mainstream media and I found all sorts of evidence that maybe competition had gone haywire. You know, there's the crazy coaches that must win or have to beat you down before they build you up. There's the parents that invest their whole lives in producing Olympic winners. And, you know, they're the children that literally feel shame when they lose. I'm like, yeah, maybe competition isn't that great. And so... So I was talking to a few parents about it, and one of the parents took me aside and said, yeah, you know, that's true, but that's really just like the fringe. The bigger truth, Jeff, is, is that I cart my kids around from activity to activity, and I'm not, I'm not even sure they want to do it, and it's taken up my whole day. Yeah. I thought, man, my experience with um, one of my boys in T-ball was kind of like this. You know, like, a lot of boredom. And I'm in the stands as a spectator, <laughs> going, yeah, I'm kind of bored too, I'm looking at my son. <laughs> and then you look at the model, here's the model, <laughs> right? I mean, at least most of the only one guy is on his phone. I mean, the typical stands I'm on is everybody on the phone, except for that one, you know, maniacal parent that's cheering him on and uh, screaming at the coach. And, you know, again, I, you know, I, I, like changed my mind. I got a little confused and I'm like, okay, well I get it. Right? I get it. Alfie's right. I was wrong. I need to rethink my whole philosophy and why don't we all just join hands and walk in the woods and come by you and collaborate on our next project, right? <laughs> and then it was literally like the next day I went to pick up my son at a nature awareness camp that he was in and I came, I was there about an hour early and I thought, you know, I'll just hang out with them. And within the space of that hour, they figured out how to compete in every possible thing you could think of, whether it was throwing something, skipping rocks, I don't know, running, chasing girls, peeing, <laughs> spitting. I mean, if they could move it from here to there, or move their bodies from here to there, they're going to figure out how to do it faster. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't. I think this is akin to asking a dog to not wag its tail. Asking at least most boys, and I think most girls too, to not compete. And so I called John Young. My go-to guy, like, what did the Bushmen do? And he talked, again, about those games. And you know what he said? He said, there's two things that he doesn't see in the Western world that the Bushmen do really well. So first is when they're in the games, and the games are geared, by the way, very purposely. They're geared to produce the skills that they need for hunting and gathering in their life, right? And I think the reason we are so strongly in favor of team sports is because the skills we need to build are collaboration and working together. But anyway, he talks about it, he talks about how they're really fiercely competitive. And they heckle each other, and they cheer each other, and they congratulate each other. And it's like, um, it's a way that they roust up the best in their group. Like, it's a way that they expect the best. And everybody performs at their peak. They, they, they move to doing their best. I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's really interesting because it's a lot like team sports and sports we have in the U.S. And he goes, but here's the thing, Jeff. As soon as they put the jump rope down, it's over. And there's no winners or losers. It's just people going for their personal achievement. And then they go on the hunt. And he says, you know, he, treats, he teaches people tracking. And he says with groups of... Western trackers are out tracking, it's almost like a competition when they're tracking, but when these guys go on the hunt, it's life or death, and they are tracking together, and it's almost like they're working together, and there is no ego in it. I just thought, you know, maybe that's a compromise. And maybe that would produce a lot more passion in our children. First, if they see us do it, and then we use competition not to beat them down or have them feel shame, but to rouse them up. So what's the solution? You know, I, I think if you want to create an environment like this, that it's really pretty simple. I think it looks like kind of like a potluck in a park, and not a playground a park, the capital P, big fields, that kind of thing. And, you know, you just go play soccer, but you play as adults. For Ultimate Frisbee, it's a favorite of mine, I played in college. 
There's all sorts of things that you do naturally with your friends that your children should see you do. And then what are your kids going to do? You know, I think they're going to watch you and they're going to model you. But the, at worst, right, if you're at a park, they might just go explore their world in an unstructured way, like real play. You know, they're just going to do things that kids do. They're just going to be children. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you guys with three questions. And questions to ponder, like, it's your philosophy and parenting. And by the way, remember the Bushman, everyone parents. So I don't care who you are. Think about this, right? One is, are you ready to play? Mm -hmm. Really? And are you ready to let your children see you at your absolute best? And finally, and probably most importantly, are you willing to make the trade? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.